Hey, how's everyone doing? Well, thanks for taking the time. I'm Albert. I'm a product manager here at MetaMask, and I'm here to talk to you about assets experiences. So who here uses a crypto wallet? Just raise your hand. Awesome. OK. What do you like about your crypto wallet? Just shout it out, because apparently this is not great engagement, but shout it out. Security. OK. What else? Multi-chain. Oh, I heard multi-chain. Great. Anything else? UI. OK. Anything else? Br bridges? Bridges. Great. Bridges. So some of the answers I expect are, you know, it's secure. It's easy to use. Connects to the dApps I use. Right? I can see all my assets and how much they're worth, et cetera, et cetera. What if I asked you what you like about your credit card? So shout out why you like your credit card. All right, money back. What else? Rewards. I love my rewards. Anything else? I didn't hear that, but yeah. <laughs> Speed. Speed. Speed's an important one. So I would expect something more like, hey, it saves me on international fees. I literally get money back for paying rent. That's a new one that I started using. I get points back when I travel. And all the things I usually pay for, I get you know, the right experience, the best experience. So as you can see, these two answers have quite a lot of division, right? Like, they're very different. In the Web2 world, these would be a given. You expect your credit card to be secure, right? That's not why you choose a particular credit card. In other words, infrastructure is no longer the reason or the level that we talk about in the Web2 world, right? Framed another way, in Web3, we're still working on an infrastructure problem. So there's, you know, we want to get accurate real-time data. There's a lot of scam airdrops. I am a proud board ape holder, but I've lost a lot of other community members through malicious links, right? Transaction simulations, and on and on. But what if we solved Web3 infrastructure? Let's just take a moment, not a moment, let's take 20 minutes. Imagine if we solved Web3 infrastructure. We solved all these issues, then what? is the future of assets experiences once we solve all these infrastructure issues. To really get into this, we need to understand what the future of assets experience is in general. So let's start by examining the history of money. So this is really interesting for me to do research on, um, because to understand what could be in the future, it's important to look at the past. So in the, the first sign of money was actually not money. It was bartering. I had a cow. I want some tea. I'll change one cow for two barrels of tea, right? We start documenting them on you know, clay tablets. At some point, we had coins to carry out fractional money, which was actually money. Then we had cash, paper currency. We created banks so that you could exchange currencies from different countries. The gold standard came in Europe so that we could actually have real value. Credit cards were introduced so that you could not only buy fast, but also borrow. Bitcoin, obviously, everyone here knows about Bitcoin, I would assume. And finally, Apple Pay, Alipay, because of the digital and mobile revolution that we have today. If you look at history, there's a reason why every single time we have a technological revolution, it came to be. Right? For clay tablets, we wanted to document, like a ledger, what happened. For coins, it became an easy way to fractionalize value. No longer did I have to trade a single cow. I, cannot, I didn't have to cut up my cow in half to get only half a barrel of tea, right? Then I had cash. Carrying me all this coin is really heavy. So cash helped it be a lot lighter and a lot more you know, transportable. Then banks made it easier to exchange. Right? If my friend didn't have what I wanted, then I had no luck. Banks made it easier. Um, at some point, we knew that with cash, you could print unlimited cash. So you'd go and actually use gold as a stable value uh, peg. We introduced credit cards, debit cards, because we want money now. Also, cash is a lot, so I just want to carry a single piece of plastic. Obviously, Bitcoin introduced decentralization. And finally, Apple Pay, Alipay introduced a way to pay with the mobile devices that we use every single day. In summary, there's five main money trends I've seen in the past. First is fractionalization of money. We went from trading whole cows to cents on the dollar. Second, we have a much easier access and use. We had banks. We have places, and places that swap money. We have easy ways to just 
tap and go. We have money now. That's a really big one, right? In the recent days, there's a lot of payday loans, a lot of ways you can just borrow, pay, pay now, like buy now, pay later, right? That's a huge trend that we've seen. And that obviously is amounting to a lot of credit card debt. There's a whole nother issue. And then four is we get money back, right? You have experiences that you want to do, no matter of the form of payment, it just happens that this payment gives me 4% back. So I'm going to choose this one. And five, looking at all these types of money, we actually are really good at accepting new forms of payment. Right now in this world, it seems like it's going to take ages for crypto to be accepted as a payment method. But looking at what we've done in the past, it's very feasible and it's going to happen. So how does crypto tie into these trends? Right? When you're building a product or you're solving a problem, you know, the problems that we have as people haven't changed in the last thousand years. So here are the money trends that apply to crypto. Right? With fractionization, we can now fractionalize and digitize physical assets on chain. We can have ease of use because we have fewer middlemen, fewer government oversight to how we want to use our money. Money now, DeFi enables instant borrowing, no more long approval processes. Right? Money back, we get to generate yield on any asset. And five is just a totality of everything here, which is with crypto, it's a new form of payment. So now if you haven't been paying attention, this is the time to pay attention. This is the future of assets experiences in crypto. As everyone knows, crypto is a borderless digital money system. Or actually, more specifically, crypto is a borderless digital assets system. And that word assets is super important here because no longer do we have to look at just single dollar values, right? We actually can look at assets as anything that has value. And we also support the fractionalization of that particular piece of asset. And Assuming, you know, in the next 15 minutes, we're assuming that the infrastructure is in place. Anyone with an internet connection can participate, and that's huge. So it starts, where does the future of crypto, where does the future of assets experiences start? It starts with the unbanked. Can anyone guess why the unbanked in the U.S. are unbanked? Just shout out answers, because, again, I can't hear you. Uh, sorry, can you say that? KYC, okay. KYC, that's a great uh, reason. Any, any other reason? Poverty, great reason. Any other reasons? All right, so according to a FDIC study, you know, 29% cited not having enough money to make the minimum bank requirements. That's huge, right? A lot of them just distrust banks, largely because of the last reason, which is bank fees, right? So in the U.S., there's a huge problem with the unbanked. But it's more than just the U.S., all right, another guessing game. How many Americans do you think in, in the U.S. are unbanked? At least. This is just some query, some amount of number. How many, how many Americans? It's probably more than zero. Okay, I heard no answer, so I'm just going to give you the answer. Six million Americans. Six million Americans are unbanked. It's at least. Also, because it's hard to report this number, so it's at least six million. And then how many people in the world do you think are unbanked? One billion. Oh, I heard one billion. How, uh, any other guesses? Two billion. Oh, hey, let's actually go right down the middle. It's 1.5 billion people. Great, great guesses. Right, so the market is huge. And the final you know, trend that we're seeing is emerging markets are adopting crypto. So last Q&A for this whole session, I promise. Why do you think emerging markets are adopting crypto? Inflation, okay. Inflation is actually a, probably the biggest reason. So it's a hedge against inflation. In 2023, Turkey had, Turkey's currency had a 50% inflation. Argentina s suffered 104%. So their crypto growth rate naturally was higher than the global average because citizens there are seeing that crypto is potentially the only way that they can keep the money that they have. Furthermore, there's more reasons like, you know, restrictions on buying foreign, foreign currencies. You're going to go and, you know, you want to send money to your friend in another country. Wire fees may up, be up to 7%, right? Those, those are huge numbers, and so crypto actually makes it easier and faster and cheaper. All right, so said all this, what is the future timeline for crypto? First, as we've seen, the unbanked and the emerging markets will adopt crypto as their money system because they have nowhere else to turn to. And we're actually 
as a pause, we're actually seeing this today. There are actually a lot of businesses, international businesses, supporting stable coins, as the speaker before was talking about, um, to actually run their businesses because their local currency is so inflated. All right, so second, to unlock these global customers and crypto customers, vendors are going to support crypto payments. That's because they're pro-crypto, they're pro-money, they're pro-business, they're pro-TAM, right? If you include the amount of people who just take cash, people are like, oh, I can't you know, go to your business because you don't take credit card. So now people have to take credit card. And then now the number of people are like, hey, I only have crypto. Now they're going to have to take crypto, right? So it's not that they're pro-crypto, they're pro-business. Uh, and then provenance and asset verification, which are some, some things that are purely uh, ba ba uh, sorry, baked into crypto, will start introducing new financial instruments and new experiences. And finally, crypto becomes as commonplace as cash and credit cards. So finally, going back to the original purpose of this whole talk, what does this mean for the future of assets experiences in crypto wallets? First, we're going to have integrated e-commerce experiences, similar to Shop or Amazon Checkout. Right? You can sometimes, you know, we started with Stripe, where you just enter your your credit card information. Now it's just one-click checkout. Now it's going to be one-click checkout with your crypto wallet. Second, it's going to be a seamless identity and asset verification. No longer, we're, once we have the infrastructure, right, there's legal, there's government, but assuming all that, it's going to be super easy to buy a house, take out loans on that house. It's going to be easy to enter events like ETH Denver with token proof. And assets don't just sit there, right? Today our money sits in a high yield savings account, gets 4%, 5%. You know, we want to do the same thing, not just with our money, but also with our assets. And then finally, there's also, or actually second to last, there's going to be a digital access layer. You can think of this as GameFi, right? There's, their experiences are unlocked through only the digital world that we have. And finally, loyalty. Like being a whale, having, you know, a thousand ETH in your wallet, different wallets are going to compete for your business. And so we're going to unlock lower swap fees just for that whale customer because we know that that customer is extremely valuable. So back to the beginning, back to the first questions I asked here. In the future, you know, showing blockchain data in a secure manner, that's going to be table stakes. That's going to be expected to even have a crypto wallet that's even competitive. But when we asked, we are asked why we choose a specific wallet, crypto wallet will say, hey, this wallet, I choose this one because it unlocks the most money for me. It's the most yield. This wallet integrates with the most places I shop with. This wallet allows me to borrow against my house in one click, right? No longer do I have to wait many, many months for approvals and you know, lawyers. Functionality, uh, loyalty. I get to unlock specific experiences because I've been a customer of this wallet for five years. And then finally, ease of use. This was just so easy to set up and pay with in the real world. Thank you.